Uh, the cough was accompanied by a tickling sensation in the pit of the throat and would wake the child every few minutes, preventing her from sleeping it for any significant length of time. So the fact that it's waking the child every few minutes and preventing her from sleeping any significant length of time, that's a, that's a fact that we have that speaks to the intensity of that symptom. So we really, really, it's highly characteristic. It's not just like it's a little worse when she sleeps. It's so much worse she can barely even sleep for more than a few minutes. So we have to have a remedy that's worse at night in sleep. If we don't, it, if it's not in that initial group of 209 remedies, it's not going to work, most likely. It's a really important symptom. Um, what I didn't check was waking. So yeah, so cough, waking on. So we need to add that to the initial group, and because it's waking her so much, I think that's an important enough symptom to not even combine and have it separate than the other group, we, which the right remedy should probably be in both of those rubrics, okay? Um, and the tickling sensation in the pit of the throat. So the question is how common is that, how characteristic is that? So you guys, there's only four, five of us in the room, or six of us, so the six of us, raise your hand if when you get a cough, you typically, it's typically accompanied by a tickling sensation in the pit of your throat. Pit of the throat meaning right here. How often is your cough accompanied by a tickling sensation? Raise your hand. You've had that a lot. You've had that a lot, but you haven't had it. Kyoji, have you had it? No? Okay. So we're kind of split 50-50. So it's not like everybody gets it, you know? Um, it's something that you probably don't even know you get or not until it's happening and someone asked you, perhaps. So I asked specifically that question um, because I was thinking about a particular remedy. So, you know, the more you understand and read up on the different remedies, the more you might even ask specific questions. You want to avoid asking those specific leading questions unless they're not telling you anything. Like, the question to ask is, what does it feel? What does the cough tell me? Everything you can think of about what the cough feels like before the cough, during the cough, and after the cough. And if they don't tell you after asking a couple times about a tickling sensation, you could say, is there a tickling sensation? And then if they say, yeah, I wouldn't count it very heavily. But if they're like, oh, absolutely, you know, I forgot to tell you that. There's this, yes, very strong tickling sensation. So then that's more significant. So you really have to, it's not just the content of what the patient's telling you, it's really the intensity of it and the assuredness of it. So if they're not really sure, oh, I'm not sure, maybe, oh well, yeah, I guess maybe there's a tickling sensation, then you kind of put it off to the side. You know, you, don't, you consider it, but not, you wouldn't use it to rule out that remedy then, but you wouldn't necessarily hang your hat on it either. So, cough tickling, 248 remedies, but if we narrow it down to throat pit, that's 54 remedies. So the throat pit is here. It, it could be a tickling from the lungs or chest down here, the throat pit being here, in the throat itself here, it's different. So if you get that specific, that you know it's right from here, then you can, you can use that as a, uh, as a symptom. If you're not really sure where it's coming from, then just use the whole group. And so you're not ruling out remedies that might actually be the right remedy. This is making my throat tickle. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. The patient felt normal or slightly chilly, but to her, Her chest, so, so to the touch, the patient felt normal or slightly chilly. But she, no, 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 I'm sorry. She felt internally normal, normal or slightly chilly. In other words, maybe she was asking for more blankets a little bit or something, but roughly yeah, the same. But to her, her chest, she described her chest as feeling hot, and she felt warm with the fever. Um, so when she got the fever, she would feel warmer, okay, and her chest was feeling hot. So we could... Um, um, we could go to chest and warmth, sensation of, and there's 37 remedies there that have a sensation of warmth in the chest. And she's feeling warm with the fever. In homeopathy, it's where, you know, a lot of stuff goes back to 200 years ago. So they, can, they call the fever heat. 
So like when the heat would come, that means like when the fever would come. So fever is is called heat in the language of the repertory. So um, we look under heat, and she felt warm with the fever. So if we go um, heat and let's see, heat and warmth. So there's nothing there in the repertory that's saying like someone that feels warm with the fever, but we're going to keep that in the back of our minds that this is someone who felt warm with the fever. So there's certain remedies that characteristically patients who are sick have extreme chilliness. So you rule out those remedies. Heat is a huge factor in homeopathy. So if if you're if someone is characteristically very cold when they get sick, um, but this patient is very warm, you can pretty much rule out that remedy. It, it, it's so, such a strong discrepancy that you would never prescribe a remedy in a chilly patient where the remedy is, is called for in a, in a warm patient or a hot patient. It's a huge, huge factor body temperature. So one of the things I always ask in when someone's sick is, are you feeling warmer or cooler than normal? Right away you've just drawn a line and you've, you've, cr you've ruled out half of the rem rem remedies in the repertory right away. You've ruled out a thousand remedies, but you've also ruled in a thousand remedies. But if they're really, really hot, there's only a, you know, a few remedies that would be really hot with fever. Or there's a few, only a few remedies that would be really, really chilly with, with the fever. So these are important questions. OK. Um, she's sneezing one to two times every minute with clear mucus. So um, every minute, that's a lot of sneezing. So we can go to nose, sneezing. There's a lot of remedies there, but we want like frequent. And if you click on frequent, no, nah, that's pretty much it. So definitely, she's got frequent sneezing. Um, the tongue is coated white with a red tip with no sore throat. So um, a tongue in acute illnesses, like any kind of respiratory infection, what the tongue looks like is very important. So a red tip or red stripe, all coated white, all coated yellow, um, different color, different, you know, you want to look at that uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's swollen and flabby and their teeth are indenting it in the back, that's something to look for too. So you want to look at all these things in the tongue and see if there's anything that really stands out. So the tongue is under mouth. And it's discoloration. So mouth, discoloration, tongue, red, redness, tongue, tip. So that's a long way to go. And using an actual repertory can be very, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of knowledge of the repertory. You have to know how to find things. So in order to get, um, red tip of the tongue, I had to go to mouth, discoloration, redness, tongue, tip. When you're doing this on your own, in the books that you have and the tools you have, you're just going to be reading and you may come across, you know, this child with this type of cough typically might have, a, you know, they may say, may be accompanied with a red, you know, tip tongue or something. So it's things to be aware of. You want to take, the most important thing is get all the information that you can in the beginning. And then once you start doing your research, you know, hopefully you'll find it. You might not, but um, the more information you have, the more likelihood you're going to find the right remedy.